the trial of William Samuel Ruto and Joshua Arab Sang before the International Criminal Court continued on the 10th and 11th of July 2014 with the testimony of the 21st prosecution witness, Mr. Gavin McFadden. Mr. McFadden was a member of the Commission of Inquiry on Post-Election Violence, also known as the Waki Commission, which was established to investigate on the 2007-2008 post-election violence in Kenya. During his testimony, the witness spoke about the creation of the commission, the investigations phase, and some of the hearings with witnesses testifying before the commission. Those activities had to be completed within a period of about three months, which was a difficult time frame, according to the witness. The witness added that a report containing the commission's findings was submitted to the Kenyan government in October 2008. Mr. McFadden said that the commission was a non-judicial body which did not seek to determine the individual responsibility of any person. He added that one of the commission's recommendations was to create a special tribunal which would be a combination of Kenyan and international personnel and investigations to deal with issues arising from the post-election violence. In the case where such a tribunal is not created, which proved to be the case, the Commission recommended that names of alleged perpetrators be provided to a special panel which could consider sending those names to the International Criminal Court for further investigations. The list of names was put in an envelope and given to former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan and a panel of African eminent personalities. Answering questions from prosecution senior trial lawyer Anton Steinberg, Mr. McFadden mentioned in particular that the Commission found that a total of approximately 350,000 people were internally displaced as a result of the post-election violence. Regarding the causes of the violence, he explained that the evidence consisted of different views, with some witnesses saying the violence was spontaneous, while others thought it had been planned. As part of your evidence regarding the violence in the Rift Valley, did you receive evidence from police officials in that area? Yes, we did. And what was their view as to the cause of the violence? Well, uh, from memory, generally speaking, um, those officials had a view, well, at least a preliminary view, that the violence was spontaneous. And on what did they base that? Well, I'm not fully sure why they based it, well, on what they based that premise, um, other than um, I recall one in particular saying that um, uh, that the authorities and the security agencies were overwhelmed and things happened very quickly. And was there any objective or circumstantial evidence before the Commission which assisted it in making its conclusions as to the spontaneity or otherwise of the violence? Well, there were some um, activities, you could say, that appeared to support um, the premise that uh, violence was planned, at least some violence was planned. Um, for example, um, the sheer number of uh, attackers, shall we say, who um, appeared in the same place at the same time, armed, attacking a particular group or groups of people. In some cases, um, roadblocks were established very quickly, those sorts of things. During the cross-examination by William Ruto's defence team, the witness acknowledged that at the time of the investigations, there was still tension among the people in certain areas. He further confirmed that while they were in El Doret, commission investigators spent less than half a day with the witness, as suggested by defence counsel Karim Khan QC. Mr. McFadden did not comment on assertions that some of the witnesses may have been biased or had a political agenda. The witness further confirmed to Mr. Khan that William Ruto's name was included in the envelope that was given by the Commission to the panel of African eminent repersonalities. 
The defense counsel argued that such inclusion had been unfair and in violation of the commission's mandate, as Mr. Ruto had not been given the opportunity to appear before the commission and clear his name. Mr. Khan further asked the witness why the envelope had not been provided to the Kenyan government along with the report. Why were individuals adversely mentioned by your commission put in a sealed envelope and given to foreigners, the panel of eminent African personalities, and not given to your appointing authority that paid for you and paid for the commission? Why? The, the process, as has already been stated, uh, the Commission determined not uh, to mention anyone in the report uh, adversely in the way that others had. And, uh, and we felt that uh, as one of the um, um, opportunities, if you like, or safe, whatever the term is, to safeguards to, uh, uh, to assist a, a process, would be to um, make a recommendation as to where, how we thought things might, uh, the special tribunal be established, that sort of thing, and that the uh, evidence um, uh, could be secured in a uh, neutral way, I guess, and be afforded to that tribunal for investigation. Can you point to any provision in your uh, appointment in the rules of procedure that authorised you to give information, confidential or otherwise, to foreigners and not to the appointing authority, namely the President of the Republic of Kenya. What was the legal basis for that, uh, that choice to exclude the President of the Republic that appointed you? I don't have a legal background, so I can't make any comment about that. For the Joshua Sang's defense team, Defense Counsel Joseph Kipchumba Kigen Katwa conducted a brief cross-examination of the witness, asking him in particular about radio broadcasts which had been mentioned in the Commission's report. Mr. McFadden further stated that he could not recall whether Joshua Sang's name was in the list provided in the envelope. As there are no other prosecution witnesses scheduled to testify before the summer judicial recess, from 18 July until 11th of August 2014, the Chamber said it will inform the parties and participants about when they would reconvene in due course. In this issue of the trial in context, the ICC Registrar, Hermann von Hebel, talks about the protection of witnesses at the ICC. The ICC takes a number of measures to protect its victims and witnesses, right from the investigation stage. These include a variety of protection mechanisms, such as local protection measures, meaning to install locks, provision of phones, and cooperate with local law enforcement on local security arrangements. Procedural protective measures, introducing voice and facial distortion during the trials, pseudonym, and ICC protection programs as a last resort measure, including permanent relocation of witnesses and families to another country.